Good evening. This is Is This Normal, brought to you by the Center for Positive Sexuality and Exquisite Restraint Corsets. Uh, I am your host, Emily, and as you can see, my co-host, Simone, is still MIA. Um, actually, she still has her paid gig, which is really cool for her, sad for us. Over the past couple of days, looking through headlines and things, I haven't seen anything big happening. Is there the anything going on that I don't know about that... No, the last thing was the 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 gay marriage bill in New York. Right. Uh, there was a scandal. Um, the uh, former s state attorney general for the state of Alabama was discovered in bed with a man by his wife. Okay. Uh, this is a Republican anti-gay conservative. So there's a surprise. Oh, yeah. That yeah. Happens. What a surprise. Okay. And uh, staunch. You know, <laughs> this is a guy who had written papers saying homosexuality was immoral and was going to be the destruction of society. And just this last week, like Monday, it was announced that his wife comes home. The guy's in bed oh, with in, in, his, in his own bedroom, his own marital bedroom, with some guy. Class. So, former state attorney general, state of Alabama. Former. Okay. Former. Well, as long as he wasn't using any vibrators or dildos, he wasn't breaking any laws. He's the person who wrote the bill. <laughs> he's actually, he's the person who wrote the bill wrote for inhibiting sex toys in Alabama. Huh. Well, maybe it's because he had his own personal sex toy that, and he didn't have well, to worry about I'm guessing, that. I'm guessing his wife, his wife is probably going to need some right about now. Either that or firearms. It's hard to say. That's probably easier to get in Alabama than it is sex toys. Oh, uh, yes, it is. It is, actually. It's an interesting correlation, actually. It's easier to get firearms in Texas. states where sex toys aren't allowed. I was reading uh, some questions that were being posted the other day, um, and somebody was asking about types of lube to be used. And I thought it was a really good question to discuss, and it might even be a good question we can discuss with our guest also, um, because she was saying that her boyfriend kept trying to say, oh, you can use anything. You can use lotion, you can use olive oil, it really doesn't matter. We don't have to use, you know, uh, KY or anything. We can use any of this stuff for lube. And so she was asking, is this true? Can we use any of this stuff? Uh, and myself and others were all saying, no. No, 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 no. Uh, you can use natural oils like avocado oil or olive oil if you're not also using latex barriers. But if you're using condoms, no, because they're going to break. You don't want to do that. Um, and lotions likely have all kinds of stuff in them that will end up irritating the vagina and irritating other areas, and it's not really good stuff. So you don't want to just use whatever's handy. And if you're really using so much lube that you're running out and looking, running through the house looking for something to use, buy more <laughs> at a time. <laughs> you need to stock up, clearly. Uh, this evening, we have Dr. Hernando Chavez, and he's a colleague and friend of mine. A uh, really wonderful guy, and we're going to bring him in to mostly focus on the topic of men's sexual health because we've been focusing on women a lot. So now we're going to focus on men for a while. So come on over. Good, how are you doing? Good. 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 Happy to be here. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for coming in. Appreciate it. Got a little crazy little universe that we have going on here. Oh, I love it. It's a sexual universe, and happy to be a part of it. Indeed. Indeed. So, when we sent out the ad copy, we gave some background on who you are and everything, but bring us up to speed. What, what is your background? What are your degrees? Sure. Um, I start off, uh, I've got a high school diploma, which <laughs> everybody's got to start off with one of those. <laughs> um, uh, actually, from Notre Dame High School out here in, in uh, Sherman Oaks in Los Angeles. Nice. Uh, then I got a uh, psychology degree from UCSB, um, so go Gauchos. Uh, also a, a marriage and family therapist, uh, master's from University of San Diego, and then a doctor of human sexuality degree uh, from the Institute of Advanced Study of Human Sexuality up in San Francisco. Bravo! Yeah, so it's a wide range of, you know, experiential schooling, uh, academic, you know, traditional schooling. So it's been, uh, it's been a blast. No complaints. Great. 
And what do you mostly do? Do you have a clinical practice? Do you do education? Do you teach? What, do you do research? Uh, don't do research. Uh, for some reason, I don't have the, the focus and the stamina for research. It's a, it's a tough world to do it, but uh, I respect those that do. So I actually do volunteer for an organization that focuses on scientific research because I truly respect it and it's so valuable, I just can't do it. <laughs> Uh, so that's the Society for the Scientific Study of Sexuality. Uh, so I help set up conferences for them, and I'm also on the board of directors. Um, I also I have a private practice in Beverly Hills, so as a sex therapist. Um, I'm also a human sexuality instructor at Orange Coast College in Costa Mesa, California, uh, and where I teach intro to human sexuality and advanced human sexuality. Um, and then on the side, I just uh, will do workshops here and there, some consultations. Uh, some of the things I really love to do is just, uh, you know, the consultations for sex toy companies or to do anything really that's sort of behind the scenes but fun and exciting and energetic and, and you know, promoting something sex positive within the community. Woo -hoo. Cool. And so you're, we usually talk to our guests and try to find out your own personal background a little bit as far as what was your experience growing up as far as what kind of sex education did you receive, how old were parents about talking about it? Uh, my sex education comprised of two letters. It was N-O. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I was raised in a very strict Catholic family. My father was in the seminary, could become a Catholic priest. Um, when he came out of the, the seminary, he married my mother, who was a Catholic virgin. Uh, from They're both from Colombia, so it was a very uh, uh, conservative and repressed you know, culture and time period. So when they moved here, uh, they just continued it, you know, in this country. Uh, so I went to Catholic schools throughout my, you know, grade school, junior high, uh, high school, and then also in graduate school. So I definitely had a lot of the N.O. and also the the sin and the, um, you know, uh, the, the, the repression that was that piece. And, and they were really very, it was more of a hush-hush issue. It wasn't so much that it was so negative, it was just not talked about. It was this uh, hidden elephant in the room. It doesn't exist. Yeah. Apparently it does because they have four kids. So four times, <laughs> happens. four times in a lifetime it times. exists. <laughs> exactly. And, and actually, something I found out later, which I thought was you know interesting, and also just based on the field that we're in, was that the, my parents, uh, when having me, they, they were the uh, proud winners of the latex and Vaseline lottery, which means they used, oh. they used a condom and an oil based lubricant. And ah. apparently, they had my sister thought that three was enough, and then the fourth one came around because. They realize the hard way that latex doesn't go well with oil. Gotcha. You've been teaching people from before you were born. <laughs> <laughs> My life has been meant to be a point. <laughs> so then how did you get into this as an area of study for you? I'll tell you what, I was always, you know, the uh, open-minded, perverted, precocious kid. I was the one who would bring in, you know, the, the naked nude photos and, um, you know, sell them to kids in school. And I, I always had that <laughs> piece to me that I was always the... Uh, you know, the up-and-coming pornographer, and um, in a Catholic school, it's you're a hot commodity if you if you've got a sex um, in your back pocket. So, uh, but then I never realized I could actually be a professional or do something with my life in this field. So I always thought I had to go down this path of you know, what I thought was you know quote unquote social respectability. Um, so I went into the the psychology and the therapy field, focusing on eating disorders and, and teen and childhood is, you know, uh, issues. And it really had nothing to do with sex until the end when I just got so burnt out with depression and anxiety uh, disorders and schizophrenia and bipolar, and I was just, I was burnt out. And I was just about to quit. And uh, I was actually watching a movie called, it's either Meet the Fockers, I think it was called. Hmm. And Barbara Streisand was a sex therapist in the movie. And so I was watching, and I thought, well, I'm a therapist, and look how much fun she's having. She has these, you know, uh, people in her, her house where she, they're doing sexual stretches and they're talking about, you know, different positions. And I thought, that looks like fun. I can do that. And, and this is the exact background that I needed for it. So I just went to, uh, enrolled in a school for human sexuality, uh, got my doctorate degree there, and the rest was just, it was the best decision of my life. Um, it really became, uh, I'm happy in life. I'm happy with my work. It doesn't feel like work. It feels like fun. It's enjoyable. Um, you know, I have no complaints, so I, I, I fell into it. Well, great. I think that's wonderful. <laughs> so, you do a lot a lot of your work, and I know a lot of your workshops and things focus on men's sexual health, um, which I think is really great, because I think very often men are sort of pushed to the side, because there are ideas that men should already 
know everything about sex, so they certainly don't need to ask anybody about anything. Um, and I think very often their sexual health, no one discusses anything or deals with anything until they're past a certain age. <laughs> and then it's, now we're dealing with dysfunctions based on age or, or health issues, uh, related health issues, diabetes and things like that. But there's like this huge gap between pre-puberty and about 55, where, you know, men, men aren't served in this way. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and you know, for a number of years, for decades and decades, I think men and women had this uh, taboo um, aspect of sex that wasn't being talked about, promoted, uh, taught, and, uh, and educated about. And little by little, you know, shows like Sex in the City or magazines like Cosmopolitan or, um, you know, In Style, and they, they've been slowly bringing, you know, women's sexuality and issues surrounding women's sexuality to the surface. Mm -hmm. um, every month, if you look at a Cosmo, on the cover it'll say, 10 best sex positions or something about the G-spot or something about, you know, uh, something along the lines of women's sexuality. And for the most part, men, we don't really have those those outlets because uh, I feel that if we utilize those outlets, people will look at look down upon us. We might be judged by other men. There might be this certain insecurities that, are, that come up from it. I don't recall buying, you know, magazines when I was, you know, growing up or even today where they really focus on men's sexuality. Even when you go to a men's health, it's mostly about how to shake your abs and how to, you know, do certain bicep curls or, or different ways to do cardio and maybe some other health aspects, but uh, sexual health is something that's just starting to be talked about with men. And, you know, there's a lot of myths with men um, as to what we're supposed to know and not supposed to know when it comes to sex. Um, a lot of us grow up thinking that we have to be these experts. A lot of us grow up thinking that we can't ask questions because it will make us look foolish or incompetent. Um, a lot of us will grow up watching, let's say, pornography and, and porn, which I think is a fantastic, you know, um, piece of media for us to use shouldn't necessarily be our only uh, aspect of teaching when it comes to sexual health mm -hmm. because sometimes we'll pick up some tips that are great and sometimes we'll pick up some tips that maybe aren't so great when it comes to you know real life uh, sexual expression right and I, and I think that that's true overall because I I know at least when we discuss things like using pornography as an aid or a tool or as part of sex education it shouldn't be the end all be all of your information. It needs to be contextualized. Um, and I think very often that doesn't happen. Yeah, I don't think we're given as, as men or women, just as individuals in society, we're not given those tools and those skills on how to actually dissect what the, the, the pieces of pornography that we can use for ourselves and what's more for enjoyment or fantasy purposes and what's more for maybe educational or sexual behavior purposes. Uh, I think porn is fantastic for fantasy and role play and, and opening your mind up to different behaviors and, and you know experimentation with new and, and, and diverse um, aspects of sexual expression uh, but I can even take my own example when I was growing up you know I loved porn to this day and I'm still growing and I still love it <laughs> but I remember uh, wanting to try anal sex with my first girlfriend in college and you know the two of us had no sexual education you know I of course I had my little pornography connected collection that I had and so that was my way of, of figuring out what to do and so she was a trooper. She said, let's do it. Let's try it. You know, it makes you happy. And she was so great about it. And so we tried three times. And I was able to get half of my penis inside of her. And it was too painful for her. She uh, said no. She said stop. And so, you know, in the movies, it looked so easy. Like, it just happened. And it was so <laughs> great. And they did it right away. And they were going fast. And it looked fun. And I didn't know you needed lube. She didn't know we needed lube. What a trooper. She was trying without <laughs> lube. Um, so to this day, I probably ruined her anal sex uh, future, um, but you know it was a learning lesson. It taught me that I'll never forget that because as a 19-year-old, didn't even know that lube was necessary for you know anal sex, and that's something that you know I may take for granted today and say, oh, that's something everybody should know, or why don't we know this? But really, a lot of us don't. How are we gonna know that? How are we gonna know? Yeah. So the church didn't teach me that. 